If you search around online for emergency heaters that you can just throw together with what you've got in the house, one of the things you're going to come across is flower pot heaters. And they work, you know, you get a lot of people insisting they absolutely do not work, total waste of money, and so on. They do, and I'm going to prove that today. But not everyone's got, you know, a stack of flower pots and a bit of clay to seal it and all the rest of it. If the power goes off and you really need to keep warm, all you need are some candles. And in this case, I'm using these. These are eight hour tea light candles. So that'll keep in an entire evening. And this bog standard cooking pot. It can be as simple as that. Now, we're lucky here in that we've got two pods that are exactly the same. So we can do this experiment on the same day with two identical pods under identical circumstances. There's a stand inside this pod here that's maybe, I don't know, four foot high. And we've got a 24 hour digital thermometer on top of that. And that's our baseline. That's our unheated pod. I'm gonna take this thermometer across. I've got an identical unit at exactly the same height in the other pod. We're gonna set this one up and we're gonna set it up with the heater running. And then we're gonna monitor what the temperatures do over the course of a few hours. So I've got exactly the same stand, identical thermometer. Uh, what I've done is I've got six candles lit. Now, the standing on this, just so I'm not going to burn the floor any, because these tea lights, when they burn down, sometimes they get a bit too hot. There's enough mass in this, the whole lot isn't going to get hot enough to scorch the floor. Now, I'm going to invert a cooking pot straight over them candles. Now, the way this works, and the way it works more effectively than just burning six candles in a you know fairly small space, is what happens is hot gases come up and they fill this chamber, fill in, they fill this pot because they're lighter than uh, room temperature air. Now, if we inverted the pot and we filled it with water, of course it'd fill up and that it'd overspill evenly over all the way around the site with water because that's heavier than air. We're just inverting the whole thing so it'll fill with hot air and it'll fill up all the way to the bottom and then evenly spill from underneath. But meanwhile, this pot is full of hot air. It's full of hot gases and it'll heat up the temperature. Nothing yet, but within a few minutes, this will get too hot to touch and what's happening is it's taking uh, what is mostly convective because of the various types of heat convective heat is what most heating systems work on is incredibly inefficient because you're heating the air that's an insulator and then using that air to heat yourself and your surroundings whereas the minute we put them under a dome like this this heats up in fact that's starting to pick up some heat already not so much on the bottom because it's thicker but the sides are getting warm and this will radiate heat and radiant heat is much more effective than convective heat so the theory is it'll heat this space, which is a fairly small space, uh, reasonably well insulated, and of course, more importantly, identical to the one next door that doesn't have the heater. And then we'll come back over the next few hours and we'll see how the temperatures are doing and how effective this is as a heater. So it's been an hour since I set up the heater. Now this is the control pod. Now that reads, what does that read? 11.5 degrees. And this one with the heater on. Is 13.4. So yeah, that's basically come up by two degrees. Now for this experiment, I pick this thing up. So I turn that on. Oh, what's horrible noise. Now that is a carbon monoxide detector. It's got a two minute boot up sequence. So I'm just gonna take this in Put that there and we'll see how much carbon monoxide is coming off from these candles. I'm assuming it's going to be a negligible amount, but um, yeah, it's there's no point in having a heater that's reasonably effective if that is then becomes dangerous to use in an enclosed space. So we're going to put this in and we're going to monitor the carbon monoxide as well. That's that set up. That's just got a minute or so left to go. And this is too hot to touch. Now, whoa, that's very hot. Now, a small radiator doesn't get as hot as that, but a small radiator does make a significant amount of difference um, in a small room like this. So yeah, that's two degrees and we're already an hour in. So we're three hours into the experiment and that is 12.1 degrees on the control pod. This is the heated pod. And that is 15.8, so that's what 3.7 degrees that's a fair old increase and as for carbon monoxide that is 10 parts per million I couldn't see it from outside 
Sorry, that's been fairly interesting. Um, 3.7 degrees, that's a pretty respectable temperature spike. Um, and with two people in there as well, we know from having done this previously, though, you know, not without testing, you know, throughout, uh, we discovered that the temperature would get up into the 20s just with having two people in there. Uh, because, of course, you know, bodies give off a huge amount of heat. So I think that's a significant enough boost to make it worthwhile. Um, the carbon monoxide issue is a concern. Now, when it comes to carbon monoxide, in an ideal world, there'd be no carbon monoxide at all, of course. It's not safe. It's something you need to be extremely cautious about, and that's something that you need to decide personally, you know, offset that against the, uh, you know, the, the effects of cold. Now, if you're running a gas appliance, such as like a hob, like a cooktop that runs on gas, that typically gives you five to 10 parts per million just without running in the room. If you're talking about something that's not quite so optimal, not a really, you know, high-end, modern, state-of-the-art gas appliance, you're talking about uh, somewhere in the region of 7 to 15 parts per million. Now, there's a lot of information out there on carbon monoxide exposure and the safe limits. Um, and there's a certain amount of discrepancy in there. You know, they, they don't all say the same, but typically um, the most reliable sources suggest that 10 parts per million is about the limit of what's truly safe in over a prolonged period. So I wouldn't want to put two or three of these in a pod and then, you know, sleep in with them. That would not be safe. Um, although it'd be interesting to give it a go, you know, without being in them with a, um, uh, a carbon monoxide detector just to see how that does. Um, but I think in, you know, the ultimate conclusion of this, I think, is if you're going to do it, a carbon monoxide detector is not a bad idea. Uh, if you don't have a carbon monoxide detector and you're going to use this technique um, just, you know, through an emergency for a couple of days, I'd be cautious, but I would still use it. Now, that's a personal decision. I'm not telling you that you should do this. I'm just saying it's what I would do. Um, on the basis that, you know, I've lived in applying, you know, places with really dodgy appliances for, you know, many, many years, uh, which probably hasn't been great for me, but, you know, I am still here. You know, it's all, you know, balancing risk versus benefit. Um, and yeah, being cold long term is horrible. It's demoralizing. It's very unpleasant. Um, so, yeah, it's one of those things that I think we've proven here today that it's a really useful technique. It has massive potential. It definitely works. But there is a small element of risk that has to be um, uh, compensated for and allowed for in that. You know, it's not a blanket. This is awesome. Let's all go out and do it. So, yeah, that's our conclusion about the improvised candle emergency heaters.